Welcome, everyone. We have 103 people on this webinar, so exciting. I'm Mary Davis Fournier. I'm the Deputy Director of the ALA Public Programs Office. And Libraries Transforming Communities Models for Change is an ALA initiative in partnership with the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation. ALA is immensely grateful for funding support from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Without their support, this work would not be possible. We'd also like to thank the Public Library Association for its partnership in this initiative. Models for Change is a two-year professional development project that gives library workers access to free training and community leadership techniques such as coalition building and dialogue facilitation. We hope that prior to the start of this webinar, you took a few moments to complete a pre-webinar questionnaire that asked you for some information on your level of familiarity and experience with uh, community engagement via dialogue and deliberation. Thank you so much for your response. At the end of the webinar, a quick evaluation will pop up again. Please, please, please respond to it. Although this webinar today is the last in our Models for Change initiative under this current IMLS grant, we hope that we'll be able to continue to be able to offer learning opportunities on dialogue and deliberation in the future. And in order to make those effective learning experiences, it is so essential that we receive your feedback to best serve your learning needs. So thank you in advance. So for those of you who are just joining us uh, in this initiative, LTC Models for Change um, does give library workers access to free training and community leadership techniques, such as visioning, dialogue facilitation, and coalition building. And the image you're looking at on screen right now lays out the learning schedule for this series Within the initiative, this series is specifically geared toward dialogue and deliberation for small, mid-sized, and or rural libraries. And this uh, is the last webinar in this series. And as you can see uh, from this slide next month, we will be presenting a free in-person pre-conference that digs deeper into the subject of today's webinar, the Conversation Cafe model. It will take its place at the ALA Annual Conference. And although the pre-conference registration, which is accommodates 50 people, is at this moment full, we do have space on the waiting list. And uh, the, that waiting list in past uh, pre-conferences has shifted a bit, and we have been able to bring people in as um, final arrangements for travel to New Orleans, uh, either take place or don't. So I will talk more about this at the end of the, the specifics of this at the end of the webinar, but if you are interested in participating and planning to attend the ALA Annual Conference in New Orleans, look into registering for that waiting list. It'll be a fantastic pre-conference. And Samantha just signed, uh, posted the link for it. So in addition to the three webinars in this series, you may wish to also check out the two previous series for larger and urban public libraries and academic libraries. The feedback we've received over the past few months is that all of these streams have been very helpful and accessed by library workers from many different types of libraries. So before I introduce today's presenters, I'd just like to say a couple of words on how fitting it is that we conclude this uh, initiative and this online learning series with uh, the National Coalition of, for Dialogue and Deliberation's own model, the Conversation Cafe. Um, over the course of this initiative, we've explored a number of different approaches to dialogue and deliberation. And Conversation Cafe is one of the most or more flexible and accessible models I've seen. And I'm very excited to learn about it in the library context. During today's webinar, Susan Partnow and Sandy Harbacher will share this model with us that is rooted really in community exploration. And um, for those of you following along, Conversation Cafe is uh, firmly placed in the exploration stream of engagement that the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation espouses. So I'm pleased to be able to introduce our presenters today. Susan Partnow is the co-founder of the Conversation Cafe model. And as an organizational development and training consultant, she enjoys being a catalyst for individuals and teams seeking positive changes through workshops, retreats, and coaching. Her extensive experience in dialogue, and facil dialogue facilitation and community building 
includes work to promote positive social change, transformative thinking, collective wisdom, and team building between organizations, government agencies, and their communities. For those of you who have been learning along with the Models for Change initiative, you'll be interested to know that Susan Partnow's work is informed by open space, dynamic facilitation, spiral dynamics, restorative circles, and appreciative inquiry. In addition to co-founding the Conversation Cafe and related Let's Talk America project, in 2005, Susan founded Global Citizen Journey, which enabled dialogue between diverse, conflicted groups in Nigeria, Ghana, and Liberia. And joining Susan is Sandy Harbacher. Many of you will recognize Sandy from previous LTC Models for Change webinars. Sandy is the founding director of the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation, our lead partner in this initiative. Sandy led the creation of this national nonprofit network. In addition to being a thought leader in the field of dialogue and deliberation, she is a research deputy with the Kettering Foundation, serves on the advisory board of the Participatory Budgeting Project, and the board of the National Issues Forum Institute. She's also consulted for such organizations as the Corporation for National Service and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Sandy has not only been a wonderful collaborator on the LTC Models for Change initiative, but she'll also be joining Susan as the trainer, as trainers at the Conversation Cafe in-person workshop in New Orleans at uh, ALA's annual conference next month. So thank you all, 115 strong right now, for being with us. And thank you, Susan and Sandy, for leading us today in this learning session. And I am going to, with that, pass the mic over to Sandy, who will get us started. Yeah, thank you so much, Mary. And welcome, everybody. We're thrilled to have you here to learn more about Conversation Cafe. It's one of my very favorite approaches to dialogue due to its elegant simplicity and its just fun vibe. So um, today we're going to familiarize you with the Conversation Cafe method, of course. Um, hopefully we'll empower you to become Conversation Cafe hosts and dig into some of the tips and techniques that can help you run great Conversation Cafes in your libraries. And for those of you, Mary mentioned this, but for those of you who um, have been on past webinars in this series, you might have noticed um, this uh, streams it's kind of a graphic before. Uh, we've got four streams of engagement. Um, this is how we categorize dialogue and deliberation based, in, based on your main purpose for doing this work. And Conversation Cafe fits into the exploration stream where you, you really want to help people learn more about each other, learn more about an issue. You're not necessarily trying to get to a decision, uh, but you want to explore an issue or explore a topic. Um, the other streams are conflict transformation, decision making, which is the mostly deliberation models, and collaborative action, which kind of combines dialogue, deliberation, and community action, really getting people to work in groups and, and figure out how to make changes in their community. So this method, Conversation Cafe, is um, an open source, simple method that allows for it to be adapted to whatever issue or topic is timely or desired. So libraries can run this kind of dialogue using minimal resources, which makes it particularly ideal for smaller, mid-sized, or rural libraries. So we hope you agree. And I wanted to start off by asking you guys this poll question. If all of you could answer this question and press submit, that would be awesome. We just want to hear what your experience is with hosting um, conversation cafe or, cafe or dialogue in general at your libraries. So the first one is about you. You or your library has hosted a conversation cafe. Or maybe the second option, you've hosted another type of dialogue but not conversation cafe. The third is you might not have been involved, but your library has hosted some kind of dialogue. And the fourth is, you know, you're new to it, your library, and you have not hosted any kind of dialogue yet. So take your time. I mean, don't take your time. Uh, <laughs> answer that question as soon as you can. And I'll share the results after we go over the next slide, which is just giving you an idea of the agenda for this webinar. So we're going to talk about Conversation Cafe origins, uh, where it came from. It has a really cool origin story. 
and the basics of Conversation Cafe. Um, Susan and I are going to introduce you to facilitation versus hosting and, and various tips for hosting in a Conversation Cafe. We're going to talk about the agreements that you need to get participants to um, look at and, and actually agree to and maybe comment on. We're going to talk about asking great questions. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about inviting and publicizing and really ask for your uh, ask you to share some of your tips for doing that. Maybe we can learn from each other here. Um, and then share some resources, um, ask you what your further questions are, and do a closing round. So that's our agenda. And hopefully the poll responses are ready. I'm not seeing them yet pop up. Oh, there they are. Okay. <laughs> so it looks like. So only four of you have done a conversation cafe um, so far, so this will be very useful <laughs> for most everybody. Um, I'm going to go back to the other slide. So 23 of you have hosted some type of dialogue in yourselves. Okay, that's great. And 15 of you say you haven't done it, but your library has hosted dialogue. And 47, almost half, have not hosted a dialogue at all yet. So. I'm so glad you're on this webinar. I think you're going to find it very useful. So I'm going to pass it over to the wonderful Susan Part now to talk about Conversation Cafe's origins. So go ahead, Susan. Great. Thanks so much, Sandy. And I'm delighted to be with all of you this afternoon and share this fabulous process with you. Little did we know 17 years ago what it would grow into being. So um, it was the summer of 2001, and I had a dear friend, Habib Rose, who had read a book by Paul Ray called Cultural Creatives uh, about people who wanted social change and, and shared a lot of values, but were feeling isolated and disconnected and didn't really know one another and thought they were alone. He, this was before the, er, the era of the Internet, you have to realize. It was just beginning. We didn't really have social media. In fact, we created something called the People Web, which we met with face-to-face. -face. We'll have to bring you together because we didn't have a place like Facebook. Uh, and he had this little black book where he had gathered enormous lists of people throughout the city. I'm here in Seattle. Uh, and he felt that if they could just come together, amazing things could happen. So he invited uh, our dear friend Vicki Robin. You may recognize the name. She wrote Your Money or Your Life and is just an extraordinary, brilliant person and me uh, to help co-host with him throughout the summer and do this experiment. So we each took a different sector of Seattle and put out the word and invited, and sure enough, people came. We were delighted and thrilled, and then we realized, oh my goodness, people are coming, what do we do with them? They want to gather, they want to talk. So I uh, had been a mediator and part of NCDD. Well, I guess it was just actually that didn't even exist quite yet. It's the same time NCDD was forming. We, um, we just played around with different methods and, and ended up paring things down to the simplest but most powerful form of dialogue. And we got really excited when we saw how powerful and, and effective that it was. And in fact, we decided to get together and brainstorm how to really launch it for the fall. So we had a lovely evening, got very excited and went home, fired up. We were going to try to create a website, which in those days was pretty tough. In the morning, we woke up to the extraordinary images of the Twin Towers. It was the morning of 9-11. We felt we had been divinely guided to create and be ready to launch this moment this movement at that very moment. And um, so we launched it and our whole community deeply engaged in, in deep questions I'll share later about how they were impacted by the events of 9-11. We saw the need, we talked more together, because I remember in the new year, Vicki was saying, okay, I guess we're done. And I was saying, what? We've just begun. And we got up, came together with the idea of having a conversation week to pop it up and make it more interesting and aware uh, in the, throughout the community and uh, hosted for a number of years, built a strong community of hosts and had a lot of fun experimenting with this. One of the cafes on Bainbridge Island that started to meet is still going to this day, Pegasus Cafe. Um, it, 
under the Bush era, it, we morphed and created a partnership with World Cafe, Etni Cafe, as well as NCDD, and formed something called Let's Talk America. And then in 2016, we were very thrilled to get the support of NCDD for them to officially take it on and host it. So we passed the baton, and that brings us to today. So when I think about, you know, why this amazing movement, uh, I, I think we see even more perhaps today than 17 years ago, we have to have a way to come together in civil civic discourse, especially when a major public event occurs, which happen way too often with these terrible traumatic events such as school shootings or hurricanes and floods. Um, we find, and, and, the, and, the, and the emerging social movements, Me Too, Black Lives Matter, immigration challenges, all of these issues, how do we come together and, and create a, a deeper, wiser democracy? I've come to think of Conversation Cafe as the most powerful tool. In fact, I think it's, it's a conversation literacy movement. The simple but powerful tool enables diverse Americans or anybody around the world to come together and engage in healthy and generative inquiry so we can have open public conversations which seem designed to be housed in a library. So I'm just thrilled to have all of you on this call to help bring it into our libraries. We can bridge across divides and bring diverse people together. And especially in this day of our hyper social media world, people are losing that chance to connect with one another. Even when you go in the cafes, everybody's doing parallel play, looking at their own screen. So these conversations bring them in face-to-face -face connection where they can share their own experiences and together become wiser and really build their capacity for democracy and diversity. So I, I, it's just so important. What the structure, and you'll see later, it takes care of itself, but the simple process. And what it leads people into is a dialogue, which is very different than debate or discussion. It opens us to new possibilities, so it's a learning conversation, kind of a voyage of discovery, whereas a, a discussion is just batting around ideas, not necessarily generative, and a debate, of course, is trying to make someone right, someone wrong, and come to some decision. So in a dialogue, diversity is really an asset, and you, so the more we can include a variety of voices, the richer the conversation will be. And it, in doing this, in, in engaging in these wonderful conversations, Participants cultivate their capacity for paradox, because there they are in this circle, really enjoying it, but realizing, wow, I never thought of things that way, and how could somebody think that? So they're realizing there's ambiguity, there's more complexity, there's a both and, it's not simple either or. It creates a, 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 a field, a circle, where we can entertain that, unlike so much of the media we're exposed to these days. And as Albert Einstein said, we cannot solve our problems from the level of thinking that created them. So I, uh, I'm delighted to share, and we really made this open source, like give it away, send it away. Everybody, please, this is a path to new and creative generative thinking. Mm -hmm. So Sandy. Thank you, Susan. Um, we're so lucky to, to have you on this webinar and, and just generally just lucky for the work that you have done um, in the no. dialogue and deliberation field, seriously. So um, this is one of the things that first attracted me to Conversation Cafe is both back when I learned about it in whatever it was, 2002 probably, um, once we formed NCDD. But one, I love how Vicki and Susan uh, talk about conversation cafes, and these are some things that you guys can use to tell people what you're doing if you host a conversation cafe. So you can say something like, conversation cafes aren't lectures, but you'll learn a lot from the people who come. No committees will be formed. I love this. Tired of small talk? Try some big talk. Um, you can say that conversation cafes are drop-in, they're simple, they're public. You could say think globally, talk locally. 
Um, Susan, did you want to say anything more about the no committees will be formed? I think this is so important um, for this process. I'm sorry, that no committees will be formed. So many of us, mm -hmm. go, we're, we're a little hesitant to join in because we think, oh gosh, am I going to leave, leave here with a list of obligations and next steps and to-dos. And this is really a freeing time to just come to dip into the deep, delicious, creative waters of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. And I wanted to share a quick story with you. Um, Actually, we have a couple of people participating in the call from the Great Neck Public Library, which is in Long Island, New York. Um, this is actually a picture from um, a dialogue that I just helped run um, a couple weeks ago at, at the Boston Public Library, um, which funnily enough, that was, that was their first uh, dialogue that they had, um, and now they're interested in having many more dialogues because it went over so well. We had about five dialogues that day. Um, and I just wanted to share this great picture. I couldn't get them just to forget I was there when I was taking the picture, but it gives you a sense of, of what it looks like. Um, but our friend Ron Gross has been working with the Great Neck Public Library in Long Island for over 20 years. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about what they do, and I want to welcome Ron and also his colleague Donna Litke, who's the program director at the Great Neck Library, Public Library, to you know, feel free to chat and add some details here. But um, from what I know about the great work that they've been doing, their conversations have taken place um, for 20 years. They take place now at the same day and time every first Friday of the month. Um, they offer, periodically they offer 90-minute host training. So Ron isn't the only one who's hosting the conversations. Um, they have collaborated over the years with various colleges and universities including Columbia, SUNY, and Adelphi. Um, their participants are very diverse, ranging in age from 23 to 80, 89, um, and they have about 40% male participation, which this tends to be a field that, that um, attracts more women than men, so 40% male is actually really good. Um, and they cover a wide range of topics from nature, wealth, humor, leadership, gratitude, luck, friendship, um, we thought it, it would just be inspiring to hear a little bit about a long-running library program that has been continually growing and innovating using the Conversation Cafe method and other methods. Um, it has been widely recognized as contributing uniquely to fostering real community among neighbors. And just to give you a taste of the kinds of um, topics you can focus on, and oh, nice, Samantha shared a link and Ron Gross had, has a little comment in there. <laughs> Good to see you guys. Um, so, like I said, the topics for Conversation Cafe are not just public issues. I mean, it's a great way to address public issues, but sometimes just issues that people always are curious about, always are thinking about, you know, relationships and dating and what that's like in 2018, the generational divide, gratitude, humor. These are great conversations that people can really dig into and Conversation Cafe is wonderful for topics like this. Um, also, you might, you might have a Conversation Cafe around a book club, around something like anime, um, an issue like death. There's just all kinds of possibilities here. And then, of course, for contentious issues like um, marriage equality, part, the partisan divide, economic insecurity, you can use Conversation Cafe for those issues as well. So just a few quick examples of questions, and later on we'll be digging more into how to, how to what makes a good a question a good question, um, how might you decide what topic to use, but we wanted to just give you a few quick examples right now of actual wording of real questions that people have asked in Conversation Cafe. So what does it mean to be an American? What makes you feel welcome or at home? It's a great way to encourage people to talk about community and to talk about library's role in building community and, and other, other places that they can go to feel at home. What moves you? How do songs, dances, and stories affect your lives? I love that one. And if you go on the, question, uh, the Conversation Cafe website, um, conversationcafe.org slash four dash hosts, you can click on materials to help you host a cafe, 
you get a list of all kinds of documents there that will um, give you other questions that you can focus on as well as things like posters and flyers, uh, the wallet cards, which we'll talk about later, um, and so much more. So, and I plan to actually add a blog post to the Conversation Cafe site in the next day or two with some, just a whole list of questions that I've gotten from these different documents that you can use for inspiration or just borrow from borrow these questions. So Susan, you can take it away and talk about hosting versus facilitating. Great, because I hope you're all getting excited when you think of all the amazing things there are to talk about, but then maybe you're asking yourself, well, gosh, could I do this? And our big answer to that is absolutely yes. I think any one of us knows how to welcome guests into our home and host a dinner party, or it could be potluck if you're here in Seattle because I don't really like to cook. Uh, so I know how to be a host, and we all do, and that's what you need to be able to hold one of these conversations. We call it a host, not a facilitator, because as a host, first of all, you're not separate from the group. You get to engage in the conversation. You don't need any credentials or a lot of training. You just need to know how to follow the process. So by the end of this short session, yes, you will be fertile, fully certified and capable <laughs> and ready to go, I hope. We'll be happy to continue to support you, but yes, you can host a conversation. We want to keep it deprofessionalized and make it more accessible. We want it to be a, an experience of empowering each person in the circle, including you as the host. Uh, we want everyone to leave a conversation cafe capable of spreading this simple process. That's why we call it a conversational literacy movement. So as a host, just as you do in your home, your home you create a sense of comfort and connection. Um, and our, our world is so much in need of this. Um, but you also get to be aware of how is it going. And in that sense, it becomes a great opportunity for you to be a participant learner. And I love that. I feel like I grow every time I host a conversation where I'm at the one time a full participant and at the other observing it and trying to help it along in a number of ways to create the space. So Sandy, show me the next slide. Sure. We want to create the space. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's the one. Uh, oh, you're going to talk about that. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, this is my slide. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. Slide. Slide. <laughs> this okay. is my slide. Don't take my slide. <laughs> so here's the <laughs> So here, here's three things that are basically your your simple roles for running a conversation cafe for being the host. It's all about creating a, a safe space for people. So one of your roles is convener. You set the time and place, you read the agreements, which we'll talk about in a minute, and you explain the process. Um, you're a welcomer, so think of yourself as being a host in your own home. You welcome people, you make them feel comfortable, but you're also allowed to be a participant. You don't have to be the facilitator who has no um, opinion. You can actually talk about um, your opinions on issues and your experiences. and and all of that. There's no need to be neutral. Um, and you're a holder for safety. And what we mean by that is you can gently interrupt someone who's not following the agreements. Um, you can ask for a moment of silence or offer to reread the agreements if the conversation is no longer respecting those agreements, which we'll go over in a minute. So that's your basic role. And Susan's going to talk about deepening the conversation. Okay, now it's my slide. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes. So once you're in that circle, uh, you, you continue to have a great role as the host where you want to invite everyone into, into the conversation. So you'll see in our process, we begin with a passing the talking object where everyone will have a turn two times. So by then, that's kind of set the pattern. But sometimes when we go into the open conversation, there's still a habit for some to talk more than others. So you can kind of monitor that and invite those who may be quiet. Um, you can really be listening deeply for what's arising that's most interesting. So could you, we, 
redirect if necessary or deepen or expand the conversation by naming some of the themes you're noticing or perhaps asking someone, tell me more. So just a few things to add a little more spice and interest to that conversation, maybe a question if it's starting to kind of get to a lull in the conversation. Or if you, the group does not have a lot of diversity and there's so much agreement, you could really liven it up by playing the devil's advocate and saying, you know, I'm noticing we're talking about um, the need for organic foods, but there's no farmers here. What might they say? You know, bring in someone else's perspective if they're lacking diversity. Imagine what this would be like for someone else. Uh, so in all of these ways, you can lighten up the conversation. And you're a full participant, but you do need to real, re realize that you have a little bit of extra power as the host. So monitor yourself a little bit uh, to not overpower things and, and really be an observer and an encourager as well as a participant. The mm -hmm. one thing you are not is shown in this next slide, and that is, drum roll, there it is. You're not a herder. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of a different approach than you might be used to because we're not committed to the topic. That's just a starting point, and it could be that as things get going, the conversation goes off to a whole different pasture, leaves, leaves the first one all together and goes somewhere else, down in the valley or over the hill, and that is just fine. As long as the group is engaged and staying fresh and curious and discovering, that is wonderful. You, they don't need to end, you want them, in fact, to end up someplace unknown and unexpected. So you're mm -hmm. not a person. And, yeah, I think that's so important because as someone who's done a lot of facilitation, as many people in our field have, it's you, one of the things you're always trying to do is keep people on topic, keep them, <laughs> keep um, right. the end in mind and keep your goals in mind. And I love that with Conversation Cafe, you can just let people talk about what they need to talk about. Excellent, thanks. Yeah. So agreements, um, first of all, I have to point out that these are the Conversation Cafe wallet cards, which are my very favorite thing about Conversation Cafe. The fact that you can fit the agreements and the process and you know description of conversation cafe all on these little business card size folded cards. Um, I just love that. <laughs> so it's and very I, important. I to, and I always have to what interject is, that I think it's my life's <laughs> greatest masterpiece. I, it just yeah. makes me so happy <laughs> that we can pass these around. I've always got to stand mm -hmm. my purse. Yeah. Yeah. And we have them we have them on the Conversation Cafe website. You can print them out. I also have a lot of them, so if you wanted me to mail you some, I'm happy to do that. My email is sandy at ncdd.org, by the way, if you want them. Um, I love how Ron just said, what's in your wallet? Because <laughs> I, I always carry a couple of them with me. But in terms of the agreements, which are on the cards, it's, it's important to read the agreements before every Conversation Cafe, almost as a ritual. ritual. Even if uh, as many people do, you have a conversation cafe that happens on a regular basis, maybe once a month and a lot of the same people come. It still helps to gather people in, kind of shift their mindset to like, oh, this is a sacred time or a different kind of time when we think differently and talk to each other a little bit differently and reminds us of the agreements that we have with each other here. So it opens the conversation space in a respectful way. And it's a it's the basis for holding on to civility during the conversation. Thanks, Sandy. Yes, it's so important to enter this. this it's like passing through a doorway to a different space, which begins mm -hmm. with this first agreement of open-mindedness, where I'm not going to just talk about it, but really work hard to listen and respect all points of view. And notice the word listen, because of course in this conversation where you're going to have six to eight people, you're going to be listening much more than you're going to be speaking. And so you focus on the listening where you realize you can benefit from the variety of ideas around the table. And we encourage people to listen to the point where they're willing to change with what they hear. They don't have to, mm -hmm. but they're at least willing to. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And the second, the second uh, agreement is acceptance. Uh, suspend judgment as best you can. 
we all judge one another, but we ask that people do their best. It means that you'll be able to hear new things from others. It also helps everyone feel safer if they think others are not trying to judge them. So that's a key agreement. Yeah, and that's really hard to do. And what helps me be able to set judgments aside is to get curious to seek to understand rather than persuade. So I don't have to agree with anyone. I just want to get it. I, want to, I don't need to get them. I need to get it and understand. I don't need to convince anyone that I'm right or they're wrong. If they express a point of view that seems really different than mine, I can think, wow, that is fascinating. How interesting. Maybe I could ask a question, like what makes you think that way or what in your life led you to that? So I can just, in my little saying, don't get furious, get curious. So please hold on to your that. curiosity. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the next agreement is discovery. Question old assumptions and look for new insights. Um, these are not necessarily polite conversations. They're designed to expose us to new ideas and to possibly even grasp something new. Um, so making discoveries, uh, but watch, watch for discoveries, basically. Um, encourage people to wonder what they're about to learn and, and look for new insights. Yeah, I think for me, it's like, if I know it was a great conversation if I discovered something new. So much of our conversations were just rehashing the same old things that we've always thought, we've always said, and this process is designed to move beyond that. Uh, and part of the process is this very important agreement of sincerity, which calls us to speak for ourselves from our heart. So very much a conversation cafe, and this distinguishes it if you were uh, at the World Cafe, which is a little more heady and interested in the thinking, the collective thinking and ideas. It's not that you don't want those thoughts, but you also really want experience, personal experience. What has heart and meaning for you? So we don't want to just hear opinions or data or get experts quoted. Uh, we really go beneath that to the heart. It's not a lecture. Uh, relate experiences to your own, I mean, relate ideas to your own experience. Mm -hmm. and, and then this final one, mm -hmm. brevity. <laughs> this is my favorite one. Go for honesty mm -hmm. and depth, but don't go on and on. Um, so honesty and depth are important to a good conversation, but so is giving everyone a chance to speak. So it's really a balancing act. Um, people can be polite with each other, so they might not want to stop someone if they go on and on. Um, but people can check themselves, they can stop themselves, and you as the host will try to model this. Um, be brief, try to get into more depth, but you might even uh, ask people to stay under a couple of minutes um, because we want to, to hear from everyone. So, and, the, and just finally, don't forget to get people's agreement. Um, what we like to do is go over all the questions, see if anybody, or all the agreements, see if anybody has any questions or comments about them and kind of get a, a verbal agreement from everybody or at least look everybody in the eye and, and um, see that they're nodding. Yeah. yeah, so. yeah thanks, Sandy, because you'll see later when we talk about how to manage things, if, if things get a little more heated than you think is wise, you go back to these agreements. So it's really like creating a mm -hmm. contract in the group. So mm -hmm. That is so important that everybody has committed to it and that they're really road tested. Mm -hmm. There's many versions of, right. of agreements and there's lots of good ones. I can just promise you that for 17 years, these agreements are so powerful. They're a great set to bring to any situation, mm -hmm. including a conversation cafe. Yeah, so another powerful part of our process, you've heard about the agreements, the other is this very potent tool. Yes, it could just be a stone, it could be a heart-shaped stone, uh, a talking object. Many cultures use this kind of a ritual in a circle. It's good to have your group in as much a circle as possible. I personally prefer no table and just to be in a circle, or if we have to use a table for it to be a round one preferably, or at least a square one and not too triangular so we're in relation. And then we have that talking object. So the person holding it 
is the one who has the floor, and no, there's no crosstalk, no questions, no comments, no responses. It's just that person's to hold. And when you're holding that object and you look around and you see everyone listening so deeply with their open minds and curiosity, you realize, wow, I, I need to have something important to say here. And it deepens your own thought process. It helps slow it down and you say, slow down to the speed of wisdom. It also equalizes the power in the circle because you're gonna pass it and each person has their chance to speak. So it crosses all those differences of age or education or race or power or role and makes everyone equal in the circle. It's always okay, by the way, for someone to pass if for whatever reason they're not ready or wanting to speak. And I must say in some uh, great circles that I've hosted where we have young people along with uh, older people, sometimes the first round the young people may choose to pass, they're a little overwhelmed, but by the second round they get it, that they're really safe here and welcomed. And then in that second round they participate and wow, then they bring so much richness and wisdom to the conversation. So it's a powerful tool of personal empowerment. It deepens and brings out wisdom. People can even stop to think while they're speaking. When do we have a chance to slow down to the speed of wisdom? So the talking object is a really key part of the power of our process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a quick question in there. We might as well address it. Um, oh. Anita asks, when a person has a question for another person who is talking, do they just wait their turn or are no questions asked during this time? And actually, I'm about to address that, but um, there is a time for open discussion. Um, but I wanted to say one more thing about the talking object, which is just you can use anything. You know, it could be a salt shaker if that's what you have available. Um, and I love how Susan you don't call it a talking stick. You know, you talked about a little bit too much cultural right. appropriation there. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It's not a sacred yeah. talking stick as exists in some cultures. It's simply something we use as the, <clears throat> the talking object, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let me say yeah. a little bit more about the process, which will help answer Anita's question too. So <clears throat> it's all on the cards, the little wallet cards. But basically it starts with um, a pre-round, allow people to quickly introduce each other, maybe say where they come from, um, and begin by then setting, you have to set the intention or provide some context. Um, you might remind them what the topic is or why it was chosen. Um, you might allow some silence to allow people to reflect on the question. Um, but this is an, another opportunity for you to model being brief, but trying to go a little bit deep with uh, what we're going to talk about at the Conversation Cafe. And then basically there's two rounds of talking, and this is with the talking object. Um, and you start by having the talking object and modeling that. In the first round, you ask for, you know, what are people's thoughts on this question or topic? You know, what are, what are some initial insights? And then you have a second round, a second round with the talking object, so people can continue with the same question or comment on something that someone else said, or just go a little bit deeper. Or if you want to, um, you could you could have a second question um, prepped and, and go with a second question. Or maybe there's something that comes up for you that you're like, oh, you know, if we have a second question in this second round, that might allow for a deeper conversation. So after the two rounds, then you have an open conversation, the open dialogue, open spirited dialogue. Um, you don't need to use the talking object here. People might um, interrupt each other a little bit and you might have to say a little something about the ground rules if it, if it doesn't quite work out. But um, you can use the talking object if, if you need to, but it's not necessary. Yeah, if I and could then, interject. Yeah. Again, oh, please. sure. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say what what really is, what you need to experience, because you can't just imagine it till you're in it, is by the time the group has done the two rounds, they're in a different mode. It's like the whole energy of the circle has shifted to this one of listening and respect and slowing down to the speed of wisdom. So it carries over into the open conversation. So you're not just picking up the way, you don't go back to usual habits. You've really 
woven a new way of being together. Mm -hmm. It's really powerful. I can't wait mm -hmm. to try it. In fact, I encourage all of you, go home tonight and do it at home with whoever's around. You know, you, you need at least three or four people um, and, and see what it's like. Mm -hmm. That's a great mm -hmm. idea. Yeah, and then, thank you, Susan. And then the final round is the reflection round. Uh, you use the talking object here, and each person says briefly what might have challenged them, touched them, inspired them, what might have occurred to them. Um, and here you might give them a few moments of silence before you start the, the final round so they can think about uh, and just reflect a little on what that was that they'd like to say and that what, what um, might have surprised them. Um, but slowing things down here really gets us to be a little more thoughtful. Yeah, and I was just going to say um, that the, the you have to sign, you have to kind of monitor the time as the host. That's one of your jobs. So if you've agreed you have 60 minutes or ideally 90 minutes for this whole process, then maybe when there's about 10 or 12 minutes left, you say, you know, we have just a few more minutes for our open conversation, mm -hmm. and then when there's maybe five minutes left, you say, okay, let's take a moment to reflect on what we're taking from it, and that that opens that final round. Uh, so I hope that it, that answered the person's uh, remark about if you have a question when someone's speaking. So you would be waiting until the open conversation time. And there's a deliberate uh, creation of some tension. Dynamic tension is the way I think of it during those two rounds. I know groups will say, we don't need a talking object. Yes, you do. They'll say, we don't need two rounds. Let's just have our conversation but then you're not gonna have this kind of a magical, generative conversation. The discipline of the process is transformative. So I really mm -hmm. urge you to be very strict about it, at least the first dozen times. And I personally still am 17 years later. I, I really mm -hmm. honor each of these components as being so important. Uh, I also noticed somebody was asking, do you take notes? And it's really not because it's so. It's just a converse, a generative conversation. Certainly, if people want to take their own notes. They could, but it's not encouraged. It's not the kind of conversation we generally keep a record of. Um, and we'll talk a little more about that later. So now you know how to have a conversation. And Sandy earlier talked a little bit about well, what do we talk about? So let's go back and, and circle back to that a little bit. Um, there's so many approaches to the topic, and, and it can just be as a simple issue like peace on earth or a theme like love. And if you add a three, maybe three questions after that, it, you'll get into the wonderful conversation mode. So maybe I would say, especially after the amazing wedding last Saturday, let's have a conversation about love. You know, what, so the first round, you see, you know, you'd say, okay, let's all just pause for a moment and think about our own experience with love. And in this first round, what do you think about it? So that's kind of a head question. And maybe when you come to the second round, you could say, so what are your feelings? What does this bring to your heart when you think about love? And then when you're ready to lay that talking object down for the open conversation, you might lead into that by saying something like, well, so what are we inspired to do about this? Uh, so that kind of brings you to the hands. So we start with the head, move to the heart, and maybe now move into what could we do. This is this is how we started our um, first year right after 9-11. We had those three kinds of questions. The topic was 9-11. We started the first round, how is 9-11 changing your life? That was a thinking question. The second round was where do you see reason for hope? So we got to talk about our feelings, and that was really important to move us towards some hopefulness. And then how could we get some agency? So it was, what are you now called to do? And that moved us into some, some doing, and those really held us well to some very powerful questions. So they could just be as simple as I've said, name the topic and then ask those entry points into the head, the heart, the hand. Uh, and, or you could frame it up in, in more, um, powerful ways, if you've ever heard of appreciative inquiry, uh, they have a whole art of framing the question. And I know World Cafe has some wonderful materials on framing the question. 
and you'll find a lot of resources on our website. And um, the next slide will show some of the characteristics that we want in great questions. We want to make sure, and this is really important, this is true even for a simple topic, that there's no embedded assumption, nor not cultural or political or ideological, and that can be trickier than you think. We learned that a lot when we were talking about guns and Second Amendment rights uh, in our Let's Talk America, where we were trying to bring the right and the left together, you start to learn certain words are triggers for one side or the other. So what are words that are more objective outside of that? So they'll be open and inviting. Uh, inviting so people can respond with both head and heart, with their feelings and their thoughts. Uh, honest, so it's a true question. It's, there's not an obvious answer, uh, but we all really want to grapple with this is issue. And there'll be a way to bring our own personal experiences. So it's an experiential question. They could tell a story or recall an experience. Oh, I had some beautiful conversations about compassion, asking people to share stories of when they either received or gave expressions of compassion. Beautiful conversation. Um, very connecting and building of hope and community. Uh, we want them to be questions that are inclusive so that anyone at the table could have something valuable to say, no matter their age or their race or their gender or their level of education or their housing situation. Uh, again, they're true questions that are generative, not just yes or no or a platitude. Um, and they're relevant. They may be broad, but they apply to so many of the real issues we each face in our personal and collective lives. And with some aim towards inspiration, bringing us uh, something that we, where we could find some answer or do something about. So those are some of the characteristics that we want to embed into our questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Susan. Uh, it's a great list. I love this. And like I said earlier, I'm going to be posting a, a blog post on the Conversation Cafe site in the next couple of days with a whole list of questions that people have used in past cafes, um, just to make it easier to find those questions on the site. So I wanted to ask you guys a question here um, about what your tips and strategies are for publicizing your events and inviting people to attend. Um, you have events at libraries all the time. so. Although we have some uh, tips that, we, that we'll share in a minute, I'd love for you guys to just type in what are some things that you do to publicize events or to specifically invite people to attend events that you have at your library. So please give that some thought and give us some ideas. Um, but we have social media, what else? Oh, posting on Nextdoor, Meetup and Facebook creating a Facebook event, flyers, newspapers, Facebook, event keeper, cool, word of mouth, yeah. <laughs> that was going to be my, one of my tips. I used to, um, mm -hmm. used to manage a volunteer center back in college, and that was one of the big ones. You just, you just have to invite people face-to-face -face and show them that you really would like them to be there, and, and a lot of times they will come. I love and this book. She book. says, what's that? As I'm noticing, uh, bookmarks. They print up a bookmark mm. and put it in the materials they check out. That's beautiful. I love that. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. What else? Now it's going very fast. Hard to keep up. City yeah, Magazine. I saw, I, I, I saw 10 <laughs> Displays. Mm -hmm. awesome. Bulletin boards, in-house in slideshows, flyers at local stores, invite people when they're at the library. Yeah, yeah and we're going to save these comments, too. Absolutely. Go ahead, and also partnering. I was thinking just partnering with other community uh, organizations and groups mm -hmm. who might want to, you know, maybe, uh, like I'll share one idea I know happen. I'll share stories in a, a short while at a library in Oregon. They talked about food. Uh, so they brought in, they partnered with local uh, organic food places and restaurants and then they brought their people in. So when you have partners, they'll bring their folks. Yeah, yeah, and especially if you can partner with organizations that represent different perspectives, try to bring in a, a variety of different people. 
Um, and one thing I would suggest, I think we made, we had a little bit of a gap <laughs> when we did our Boston Public Library events. We told people, you know, the topics that we were addressing, you know, please join us, but we didn't really explain what dialogue was or what they would be experiencing. Um, so sharing a story, tell them why you're hosting the conversation or a little bit about what they can expect, a little bit about what dialogue is. But these are awesome suggestions. Thank you guys for, for participating. And then Susan, if you want to talk about supplies. Yeah, right, because now we've got the people, we've got a topic, we've got the process. Uh, there's just a few other things. We, we talked about the talking object and how it could really be anything. For me, it could be a great excuse to go shopping and get some fun little stone, one of those stones in a new age store. I'm a real sucker for those. Or it could be a fun thing like a koosh ball, although I have found when it's round and throwable, if you have young people, not a good combination. Uh, but our original conversation cafes, we use these little balls that look like the earth, and we loved using those. So it could have some symbolic meaning for your community or the topic or it could just be a salt shaker, um, something that's comfortable to hold in your hand. It can be good to bring, uh, to supply three by five cards and pencils. So for example, as someone mentioned, during a round, somebody might say something and you're thinking, oh, I really wanna know more about that or I didn't understand that. Well, if, you're, if the, that participant is concerned about remembering, they could jot it down on their card and then look back at it later and see if it's still something they wanna ask. So it could be a tool to help them stay present and really listening. And sometimes for the reflection round, you may ask people to really pause and think about what they're taking and maybe they could even write down their thoughts or in a similar style, if you took the World Cafe session, they often say, what's the deeper question arising? So they could write that down on a three by five card if you really wanted, for some reason, you could collect those. You know, what's the key thing you're taking from this conversation? Maybe that, if you're doing a series, could be helpful. So three by five cards and pencils are handy. I love name tags. I think they really help build community. You could have something else on the name tag, like where they're from, depending, you know, if it's a neighborhood here in Seattle, or if you're in a rural area, there could be uh, different parts of the area, the region. Uh, in many of our communities now, they want your pronouns. So there's different things you could add on your name tag. And then I urge you to have those wonderful the Conversation Cafe wallet cards to give away. So everyone leaves the conversation with the simple process. And if you don't have the means to get the actual cards, there's also off of Conversation Cafe website a simple sheet where they're printed up quarter size on the page so you can cut it into four, so really easy to copy and produce. That's spreading this conversational literacy. If everybody leaves with that whole process, so now they could bring it to their next Thanksgiving family table or their workplace to have these kinds of conversations. Mm -hmm. um, so, yep, got the content. The, with the topic, the process. We haven't talked that much about the dialogue in the middle. And that's because from my perspective, it will go beautifully. But I know from having supported and, and helped get new people ready to host that this is where you're probably gonna be worrying. Like, oh my goodness, what will really happen when we, when we let them go? And I, I can just assure you again and again that by this point where people have come together intentionally to have a dialogue. They've gone through the agreements. They've respectfully been heard and listened to each other. This part is beautiful. So just go back to your hosting of keeping it inclusive and maybe adding a question here and there, searching for deeper meaning uh, that you could enrich the conversation. But these are like the extra bonuses. If you don't do anything, it'll still be fine. Uh, you could ask for some specifics rather than generalizations that somebody's getting kind of way theoretical. Uh, you know, could you give me an example or what in your life led you to that? Um, if things do get contentious, you have the agreement to go back to. They are your friends. So if 
something starts to get really heated or disruptive or feels like it's violating our agreement, as a host or really anyone in the circle could pick up the talking object and say, let's stop for a moment. So my first important thing would be to slow things down. Let's take a breath. Let's just slow down and let's reflect again on our purpose today and remind ourselves of our agreement. And perhaps you could even read out the particular one that may be getting violated, like let's remember to be brief or let's remember to set judgments aside and stay curious. Um, and then, you know, put the object back down and trust things will go better. And I would say for the most part, in so many dozens, probably hundreds of conversations that I've participated in, that has all been all that's needed. And occasionally, yeah, something could get a little off. And I've learned when I have no idea what to do, I don't need to know what to do except to pick up the talking object and say, let's stop for a moment and breathe. And then trust that in that silence, greater wisdom will come to me or someone in the group as to what we should do now. Um, yeah. Did you want to add anything to that, um, Sandy? Uh, no, I think that's very well said. Yeah. Yeah. Great. All right. So, yeah, just try it. Trust it. Be willing to take a, a risk, and I promise it'll be okay. You know, no one, nothing terrible can really happen. Um, so, I wanted to share some other stories from the field, and these come from another wonderful conversation host from way back when, Heather Tischbein, who has engaged the Fort Vancouver Regional Library System in Washington, it's just across the uh, Columbia River near Portland, uh, for over 13 years now. Civic engagement is a key part of the charter for that regional library system. When I asked her what, what drives her all these years, she said uh, she just has such a desire for diverse people to gather and engage in meaningful conversations. In fact, the next slide, Sandy, why don't you uh, show that? It gives a, a, an important quote she oh, mentioned. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, we want people to have good enough experiences talking with strangers that we whittle away at the notion, the belief, that we are too polarized to talk to each other as citizens and community. So especially given our, you know, the climate today, this is what's feeling most important to her and has really driven her all these years. When I asked what's led to her success, a couple of key things that she mentioned was she realized there has to be a champion of Conversation Cafe. In her case, she's the champion. We talked about Ron Gross mm -hmm. earlier in, at Great Neck. He's the champion. But then she found a good partner, as did Ron, in the library system. So you could be that partner. And I'm saying to you, you need a partner, not just you alone. It could be another staff person or someone who's a volunteer or a board person or somebody in the community, maybe somebody from a college nearby. Um, so you partner together and then you among other things, you're building capacity for hosting because your champions could also be people who participate in the conversations then get so excited, like, oh my God, I love this, I want more. Great, empower them to help organize more conversations. Um, some of her key advice to you as librarians uh, was to, yes, you need to have a plan, and we've helped you today figure out how you'll create that plan, but be ready to change and adapt and kind of let go of the idea of managing it, because it's a different, if you get comfortable with the idea of emergent, this is an emergent generative conversation, not a control discussion, as we talked about before. It's not outcome-based. It's a chance to connect with others to bring strangers together in a truthful, authentic way, in a, in a more civil way. Uh, and her final words that she wanted me to share with you today uh, is to persevere, have patience, to know that each conversation plants seeds that germinate. And um, I would just add to that, have a great time and enjoy this whole process. 
Right, right. It is a lot of fun. It so really people can. have been asking, Susan, just so you know, they've been asking questions about this in the in the chat. So this is perfectly Ooh. timed. Perfect. Yes, because clearly you don't know how many people are going to show up. And we hope you'll be so successful that your biggest problem will be how to fit everybody in the room. <laughs> so <laughs> um, this little chart is set up to show you on the left what's going to happen that you will handle, let's say you're the champion of what we could think of as the meta host, the, the uber host, the one who is overseeing the whole thing for the whole large group. And then on the right is what's going to happen in the smaller circle, because you're going to take your group, whether it be a dozen people or 20 people or even 50 people, whatever the, the maximum capacity is for your room, um, you'll start out with everybody together although you may physically want them to already be sitting in small circles all around the room. And again, if you were in the World Cafe, it's a, it would be kind of a setup like that, although they only have four people and we advocate for six to eight people make the ideal circle uh, size. If, if there's 10 people, I encourage you to split into two. And why is that? Well, going around the circle two times and listening to each person with that talking object can takes a lot of concentration and it can be tiring. So it's easier to listen to five people than to 10 people. So I would encourage, you know, splitting the group. Uh, and you just recruit the, somebody in the group to uh, be your host. So, all right, so let's imagine you've got your room, everybody's sitting more or less in circles, or semicircles, listening to you at the front of the room, and you start out with the first part of introducing the process, which is reviewing the agreements, introducing the talking object, and explaining the process, and even maybe talking a little bit about what your topic is for the day. And then you're going to direct them that you're now going to work in your small circle of six to eight people. And each of those circles should have a talking object, and you can say, someone, please pick up the talking object, and guess what? You get to be the host for your circle. So in each circle, there's a talking object, a person holding it is now going to be that circle host, which means they begin the round. So they need to be able to see what the question is, which you could have on little slips of paper for everybody in those circles, or if you could have a PowerPoint at the front of the room. I like to have the little pieces of paper so they stay very focused and intimate, like they have their own little community formed there. So the, they've already gotten an understanding of the process that the circle host will do round one, will do round two, will then lay down that talking object, and they'll engage into their open conversation in the middle. So this is going on all over the room and everybody's at their own speed. They're not synchronized. They don't need to be. You at the front of the room, you know, you're kind of looking to see if anyone looks confused or needs help, uh, but mainly you're just breathing deep and sending good vibes. <laughs> That's your, your job, you know, to everyone's having a good time. Welcoming latecomers, leading them into a circle, which by the way, I find works just fine. The circle is strong. If somebody arrives late, you can just add them into a group. Um, but you want to pay attention to the time, whatever your agreed ending time is, when there's maybe 10 minutes left signal that we, you just have five more minutes till we're going to begin our closing round. And then five minutes later, signal to everybody. Personally, I like to use a chime or a bell. Um, that it's time, host, please pick up the talking object and begin the closing round. So then back in each little circle, they're each running their own little, uh, their own closing round, and they're not going to all begin, uh, end at exactly the same amount of time, um, but you decide your time. Uh, you could maybe give them a warning, one more minute, and then finally, now we're all back as a whole group, and Hopefully you've saved five or ten minutes to your overall time for the evening or day's program uh, to come back together as a whole group. 
and you might want to, we call it popcorn out from a few people, a few key takeaways. And by that, I mean you're not systematically asking each group to report out. I know you have something to say about this, Sandy. So I know it's one of your pet peeves. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, one of my pet peeves is one, especially when I go to a conference, everybody gets into these small groups where there's lots of energy, and then they say, okay, let's hear from a few of the groups. And everybody, one person from each of the groups stands up and goes over, this is what we talked about. We talked about this, and then we talked about that, and then we talked about that. So I love that. You say, have a few people share some key takeaways. It doesn't have to be, you know, here's all that we talked about, and we don't have to hear from every every table if you have a number of tables. But, yeah, this is such a helpful yeah. slide. Thank you for putting this together. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, what they're sharing may not be about the content. It could just be about this was such an amazing experience. I feel so connected. My heart is so open. Mm -hmm. So they could be sharing mm -hmm. about their experience as well as uh, – the topic, but it's it's really mm -hmm. nice, I believe, to end with some sense of a whole community together. Um, mm -hmm. It's not necessary, and I, it could depend on your community, the topic, the setting. I, I see some of the questions are, could you do it in an open part of a library with adaptable seating? I mean, they're going to be talking, so I always have the idea of a library, you're supposed to be quiet. So it has to be in a place where you don't have to be quiet. But people could go off to different areas in the library if that's the way you're set up, if they're not all in one room. Uh, so then you mm -hmm. would just explain everything and then send them off, and they wouldn't mm -hmm. come back together. And that would be okay. That can work just fine. Maybe you would walk around every now and then <laughs> to check in to see how they're doing. Mm -hmm. I was just laughing at Amy's yeah. comment. My library sure ain't quiet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and we just at the Boston Public Library, we had a couple of private rooms, but then we had this big um, kind of cafe area where we had one of the dialogues held, and and mm -hmm. that was kind of nice. And we just made sure that that wasn't going to be a super private topic, something like sexual assault or, <laughs> you know, I think we focused on immigration in that one. Yeah, but, and um, I think yeah, that's fine. feel free. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you. I was going to say yes, because, in fact, traditionally where conversation cafes started were, in fact, in cafes. And these days young people like it in bars uh, where there's food and drink and noise and other people. And sometimes we've recruited great participants by just people are noticing you're at this conference, you know, and just say, come on over and join us because they are drop-in and open. So, yeah, there mm -hmm. doesn't have to be any constraint around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so please, guys, if you have further questions about Conversation Cafe, we'd love to have you type them in here, and maybe we can get to a couple. We have to um, finish up pretty soon. But um, we also, you know, if there's other questions that you have at the end here, we'd love to have a, a blog post on the Conversation Cafe site that goes into some answers to those questions. So feel free to let us know what you're still curious about at this point, or um, you know, what you'd love to know a little bit more about. So feel free to add some things in there. Did you see any other questions? Or Samantha, did you see any questions that we haven't answered that maybe are easy to answer? Um, yeah, one might that might be easy to answer is Nicole Steves asked if you have a sample one-line blurb to describe the experience in their marketing materials about Conversation Cafe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I put something in the comments linking to a document that is about publicizing your cafe, and um, I included a blurb that says, I'm hosting a small group conversation at whatever time on this day and in this location. <laughs> I'd like to extend an invitation to you or your network to attend. I'll be hosting the discussion using the Conversation Cafe format, which means we will use a simple method. Whoops simple method to allow everyone involved to meaningfully contribute. And that's one of many, many ways to invite people, and there's lots of resources on the site, um, on the Conversation Cafe site that give you other ideas. Yeah, I really encourage people to spend some time on the site poking around in that whole section on resources for hosts. There's so much good, rich stuff there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it might be time to go forward and talk about the resources because I, we want to give a little time at the end 
for uh, Mary to tell you some things. But I'm just checking to see if there's any more quick questions. Anita says, so when you have multiple groups, the host of the small group does not have to have any prior knowledge of how to deal with the group. That's a good question for you, Susan. And, and I think you said that sure. the host doesn't, yeah, the host needs to have the, everyone in your group should have the Conversation Cafe wallet cards in front of them. So yeah. she or he has the process in front of them and they don't necessarily have extra facilitation skills that we talked about, but. Um, right. I would encourage you to test it out. You know, it's always, you'll be more comfortable. So I think just try it out with your own friends or at your next library meeting, at your next team meeting, have a mini conversation cafe. It'll be a wonderful way to build, uh, to build your team, choose whatever's on your agenda. You could use the process to have that mm -hmm. conversation in your team meeting and then you'll have some experience and, you know, you'll get more comfortable with, the, with running it. Uh, but it's not that you need special skills, but we just like, you don't want to make a really fancy souffle mm -hmm. and invite your boss, your husband's mm -hmm. boss, the first night you have a dinner party. You might just invite your friends over and test the recipe. So that's mm -hmm. all I'm saying. You don't need the special skills. Uh, the other thing that I noticed, somebody was asking about immigration, for example. Would you invite immigrants? Would you invite an anti-immigrant? You know, and I think all those things depend on your purposes and your community. Personally, I love diversity. I think that makes it interesting and trusting the process and our humanity that we'd have an interesting, fruitful conversation. And uh, that's where I was, I think I forgot to mention that um, Heather at her library, they sometimes had a simple panel where they have the panel kind of do a fishbowl round around a question and she'll get some purposefully different perspectives or roles of people from the community and then go out to the group to have their own conversations seated by that short panel discussion. So there's lots of ways that you could bring in in that diversity. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, and I'm yeah. going to move on to oh, okay. the resources just... because <laughs> I do worry that we're <laughs> running out of a oh, little yeah. time. and. There's some great, great questions in here that we will take the time to answer, and I know that that Mary and Samantha are willing to share with you guys um, further responses to some of these questions. So um, anyway, let me just tell you a little bit about a few resources you can go to. Of course, the Conversation Cafe website, which you might have been perusing already, the resources for hosts, which is at conversationcafe.org slash for dash hosts. And then, um, of course, the ALA LTC site has a whole host of resources for libraries, including links to Conversation Cafe resources and resources for all the other models featured in the Models for Change initiative that's been going on for, it's been over a year now, huh, I think. Um, all the webinar recordings for Models for Change are also available on this site. And I, I must say a little shout out to my colleague, Courtney Reese, who's on the call too, who has been on every single webinar and has helped to make these things happen. Um, she really is an amazing soul. And the Community Engagement Listserv is a great resource for connecting you with your peers as you explore these models and start to try them out. You just need to send an email to this address on here in order to join. So hopefully those are helpful and I wanna just Thank you all for participating. Uh, we have a quick closing round here, just like in a conversation cafe, but if you would be willing to just type in a word or phrase about something that you are leaving with um, from this webinar, we would really appreciate it. And that's our closing round. Oh, excitement, inspired. <laughs> Someone said, just try it out. Possibilities, inspiration, head, hearts, hands, new ideas, energy to try this. Good. I'm so happy to hear that. Hopeful, creative. I really feel that I can do this. Yay. <laughs> That's what we were hoping for. Useful right now. Awesome. Ready to try. Relinquishing control. Doable. Prepared. A plan to move forward with. All right. So... Wonderful. I'm glad that you guys feel that you can actually take this and run with it because that's what it's designed to do.
Now, I'm going to pass things well, over actually to Mary yeah. at this point. But uh, Susan, if you'd like to have a closing well, word I or two. Would, yeah, I'm, ju I'm just thrilled. And I, I just wanted to say we're here to support you. Our worst, we would love our worst problem to be that we're overwhelmed by the response. So please try it. Let us know how it goes. And if there's a big demand, we could maybe even create another call to support you after your first experience. Many ways. So please go for it. Let us know how it goes. Definitely. All right, on to you, Mary. I hope everyone can hear me. Thank you so much, Sandy and Susan. I feel like we crammed like half a day into this <laughs> into this webinar in terms of actionable, wonderful uh, information about Conversation Cafe. So um, I, before I get into specifics about the badging cred credly code and the badging credential you can collect after viewing this webinar and more in the in-person workshop, I want to touch on another great professional development resource coming up, and that is the NCDD 2018 conference. Every two years, NCDD hosts a national conference, and their 2018 conference is coming up in the fall in Denver as part of our collaboration with uh, NCDD in this initiative, uh, they have set up a discount code for librarians, library workers. Uh, the discount code is ALA-LTC, and it extends the super early bird rate of $350 for conference registration to uh, librarians into October. So past all their deadlines right up into the um, conference itself. I attended their last conference thinking I knew a fair bit about facilitation, dialogue, and deliberation, and I was just so impressed by the community, by the great array of models, the cross-sector learning I experienced, the possibilities for libraries. Um, we are working with Courtney and Sandy to provide uh, LTC models for change content for the um, at this conference, and we really hope that librarians will stand up and be counted and take advantage of this learning opportunity if you want to delve more deeply into this work with your community, and if, of course, if you have the ability to attend. Um, with all that libraries are doing, we'd love to see more library workers help to shape the conversation in this sector. So check it out. Um, and I believe Samantha just posted saw a link for that conference. So um, to claim your badge for this, um, this webinar, uh, here are the instructions on this slide. Claiming these digital badges is suggested but optional unless you'd like to participate in the Conversation, conversation Cafe in-person workshop in June next month in New Orleans. To participate in that session, you absolutely must have completed all the online learning sessions in this series for small, suburban, and rural public libraries. And that is basically how we're able to track participation through this badging system. So the deadline for claiming your badges uh, through Credly to remain eligible to participate in the free workshop is next Friday, June 1st, 2018. So please get those badges claimed. Um, the, then just to reiterate, again, this is the final webinar in our series. You can still get on the waiting list for the in-person workshop in June. Um, after the June 1st deadline for badge credly collection, we'll be able to finalize the registration list and notify folks on the waiting list. And we'll give you, of course, another week probably to claim your credly badges and get all that uh, finalized. So this is going to be a fantastic, practical, hands-on workshop, an extension of this webinar led by Susan and Sandy. It is entirely free to participate in the workshop. Again, we ask that you complete the entire series and the related reading and viewing that is um, listed on this slide right now. Again, please complete your post-webinar um, survey monkey so that we can learn from your experience and improve and keep getting, uh, hopefully, funding to support this important work that, and with, that you are doing and you all as participants are leading in the field. Um, I want to give a final thank you to our presenters, Sandy Partnow, um, I'm sorry, Susan Partnow, Sandy Herbacher, 
Our thanks as well to NCDD, IMLS, PLA, ACRL, and our Models for Change Advisory Group for their guidance, as well as my colleagues behind the scenes on this team, um, Courtney Breeze, Stephen Hoffman, Samantha Oakley, Brian Russell, and Sarah Osman for their support of this webinar and the Libraries Transforming Communities Models for Change initiative. I think we have 30 seconds left, so I'm going to say that this learning webinar has been a part of ALA's Libraries Transforming Communities initiative, which addresses a critical need within the library field by developing and distributing tools and resources to support the work of engaging communities in innovative ways. Thank you all for your excellent questions and for your attendance and participation in this initiative. It has been great.